Welcome, everybody. This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book. I watched a movie. This week, we're doing High Flying Bird, directed by Steven Soderbergh. Right off the top, we need to address it. No, you're not mistaken. And no, we did not take a time machine back one year exactly. High Flying Bird actually premiered on Netflix this time last year. We've been going about it all week as if it had just come out. (laughs) And we were so excited. (laughs) Did all the research, watched the film, got deep into it. I'm, I'm talking about things I don't even, I don't know anything about that. Anyway, so this morning, right before, we're, I'm like dotting some I's and some T's and some dates from my notes. And I go, wait, 2019, what, huh? What, huh? <laughs> and I realize, oh my God, it's a year ago. But immediately I realize how topical, relevant, and we can still shed some light about how it's going to be become relevant towards the end of this year and going into 2021. So we thought full steam ahead. It's Black History Month. We're doing it. Uh, High Flying flying Bird. bird. Yeah. Uh, Directed by Steven Soderbergh, which we already did a film of his. The Laundromat, uh, about the Panama uh, scandal. We did that back in the fall. So he actually released this last year before that. And it has a screenplay by Terrell Alvin McCraney, the co-writer of Moonlight, who wrote the play Moonlight, of which the movie is based uh, so that is pretty incredible. The lead is also from Moonlight, Andre Holland. And he was also in Selma, which we did a few weeks ago. Mm. Uh, he played Andrew Young in Selma. So another callback to whatever. Yeah. But Andre Holland leads this as Ray, a, uh, a fast man- talking yeah, yeah, yeah. agent <laughs> for the sports NBA industry. Although, interestingly, in the film, because the NBA did not approve of this. I think they only say the NBA once or twice. They never say any team names. They don't have any official reference to it plays very coy around (laughs) around the idea of the nba and and basketball and and the high profile uh negotiations and dealings that go on around this this is very much jerry springer vibes (laughs) right (laughs) and uh the whole point was steven soderbergh the story was by andre holland yeah real quick let's prep it since this came out a year ago and this isn't something that's being advertised what this movie centers around an nba lockout Right. Uh, which I didn't know what that is. Taylor, please illuminate me because I, I've, I've done all this research. I have all these thoughts about race in America. I don't, I, you know, like I, the, the change of the media tide. Uh, but, you know, what is a lockout? Yeah. That's what this all centers around. A lockout. So it's based on it's, this is a fictional account of a lockout that would be happening in the future. There have been four lockouts that happened in the NBA. Mm. The most recent one happened in 2011. And what it is, is basically the opposite of a strike. So with a strike, you have unions and you have the employer and the unions are saying we need better pay, we need better working conditions, Uh we need uh all that stuff. And so they go on strike. And they stop working. And they stop working for those conditions. So these players got a ball. (laughs) So these players, are we going to play. Right. Well, a lockout is the opposite of that. It's where the employer stops the work Ah. because they're wanting to renegotiate with the union. And so... They lock every litter. That's why it's called a lockout, because it's like gotcha. literally you would lock the employees out of the warehouse. They wouldn't be able to go to work. They don't get paid. They don't get the benefits. And in the case of the NBA, it means that the team officials, the coaches, the owners, the staff, they're not allowed to talk to their players. No one gets a paycheck. Everyone's contract technically is expired until the agreement between the players union and the owners and team owners and the National Basketball Association agrees. Hope you don't have a life or plan to get anything done in that time frame. Yeah. (laughs) Or knew that it was even going to happen. Surprise, you're on freeze. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And you can't talk to anybody and you can't go train and you can't go work out. Shut up, shut up, shut up. So that is what a lockout is. And the reason the one that happened in 2011 happened very, very basically, since I know very little about sports as well, is that the players wanted the NBA to be more like Major League Baseball because they wanted bigger salaries that are guaranteed to pay out even if a player underperforms. Mm-hmm. It's like contracted, like you can't just dump them or not you know, cancel it or whatever. Right, it's like, well, right. you said that I was going to get this much per year, whether or not I have an injury or you put me in. This whole thing centers around young talent in the mm-hmm. sports industry. I mean, and young talent are the most acceptable to being marginalized and manipulated by from all sides of their career. People working for them, people working against them, wherever their services are needed. Uh, young talent is such a... Uh, 
it's almost a sacred thing. Like you have, it, it is, it is the gateway for careers to just completely be destroyed by no hand of what actually happened in the game. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's just something we don't hear about very yeah. often. And, and a lot of things happen and, or don't happen based on what goes on behind the scenes. And that's what yeah. this is really, this whole thing is touching on actually. Okay. You went to the game, but what's going on the 72 hours after game between a game? Uh, what's the going game on is in the-, the small, silly little recreational fun part of a massive, massive, Massive industry. That's what Steven Stoderberg said. Exactly, and the film goes goes to 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 show you how the game is actually it's important, but it's it's he doesn't show anything about and if a game's happening, it's happening on a screen. So this is about this manager trying to how can he wield uh, as much credibility for the players? How can he wield wield that financially while nothing is in play? How can you actually one up the game while you're being played? Yeah. So if you're interested in sports, but not in you don't want to watch another Rudy or remember the Titans or something where it's just all about the championship game. This is about what happens when the sports part of it fails and it's strictly the business of it. Absolutely. That's what this story is. Um, yeah, it's 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 all over any any kind of public persona. This is a this is a major issue, but it's interesting, particularly in this movie, because it relates directly to the black experience yeah. in America uh, and 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 basketball in particular. So mm-hmm. I think that's where really where this stands out. Yeah, uh, I, I can't think of another piece quite like it. And the reason it's relevant, as we found now, is because this thing that happened in 2011, the actual lockout that took place, reduced the NBA season from 82 to 66 games lasted 161 days so they lost a lot of revenue oh my gosh but this whole thing was a 10-year tentative agreement which is then needs to be re oh my gosh in 2021 so looking towards the end of this year we're going to be seeing so in 2021 so think about that that means we're already the beginning of 2020 exactly what taylor's saying at the end of this year those conversations are going to start happening about what's happening for next year so this is going to start unfolding again Later this this very and, year. Yeah. And what this movie is postulating is that social media players owning themselves versus an owner or team owner telling them exactly what to do. Like there's a lot more agency and free agency involved with how our world is now, even versus 2011, where oh, you had yeah. to have men in suits at a boardroom table figuring it out. There might be leverage. And what's so interesting is Steven Soderbergh is using the movie itself as a message from movie making, you know, because his career trajectory, he's made 30 movies plus, and these movies are extremely low budget, extremely on on his own. Real quick, just for some context here, Soderbergh has directed the classic Traffic, Ocean's Eleven, Magic Mike, as we said, the laundromat. He had a movie come out the, a couple years ago called Insane, which also s- shot on an iPhone. But oh yeah, this th- movie shot on an iPhone. That's another well. big yeah. thing. This is shot on the iPhone, and I swear to God, I've seen a couple movies shot on an iPhone. This one, if you hadn't told me beforehand, I would have had zero idea. It just looks like a very conventionally shot and made film, and no, no idea. And then when you realize that as a filmmaker or a creative at all, you go, oh wow, he kind of went out of his way to prove how you can kind of uh, transplant and highlight major conventional cinematic coverage uh, technique with an iPhone. (laughs) Um, It's, it's, it's quite, it was quite an impressive thing to see really kind of realize how slender this was. It was made on a budget of $2 million. Yeah. Uh, Steven Soderbergh, one of the, one of the biggest working directors out there right now made a a $2 million movie. In New York City. In New York City with amazing, with an amazing cast. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, Zazie Beetz is one of the big names of this. She plays the assistant character Mm -hmm. that ends up with the uh, player at the end. She's from Atlanta, the FX show, if anybody's seen that, of course. Uh, Joker, which we've covered. Um, so she's all over the place. She's a, she's a big... It, it's just got an incredible cast. I'm, the, more I'm, the more I realize, the, the more I'm shocked that it has gone under the radar, honestly. Because yeah. we, really, we really did th- think it was new because I haven't <laughs> heard of any of this. And it's so topical <laughs> and it fits in with what people are interested in now. 100%. As Steven Soderbergh is talking about making this film for nothing and he's quoted if we don't need the studios it's at least worth asking if athletes need owners yeah he's fascinated by that concept because he proved that you can do that yeah and he still keeps ties with people he's friends with david fincher and christopher nolan and all the people that are (laughs) in the big studio system but he's just as revered and respected oh yeah and it's just him and an iphone in an elevator with these actors and that's the scene (laughs) It's just crazy. It's pretty staggering. It kind of shows you how bloated modern movies can be. Yeah. Um, 
the quality of this compared to something that you could spend 10 times, 20 times, 100 times as much as they spent on this movie and end up with something lesser than. Yeah. I saw even more in terms of his influence. There's a film called Unsane, which came out in 2017, shot in secret. Nobody knew he was doing it, but this was (laughs) also... This was also shot on an iPhone. The budget was a staggering one and a half million as opposed to two million, <laughs> Look which, at that. which yeah. this movie was. Look, they, and they almost refused to make anything under $50 million anymore. Yeah. That, 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 that type of movie has disappeared from the weekend box office. They don't. Mm-hmm. They just don't do it. Yeah. And this guy's out here throwing them down. Look, he had two major movies come out last year. I don't know how conventionally Laundromat was made, but right. this, this movie and Laundromat both came out last year. This to guy, Netflix. He, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. We're not talking about him enough. The, yeah. the, the more I'm realizing, actually, the more I've been like delving into this and who he is and what every, you know, well, the everything other reason, else he's been yeah. doing, I go, my God. The other reason we're not talking about him enough as well is because he changes his name. So I looked into Unsane as I was doing my research. I saw the cinematographer was Peter Andrews. And so oh, I looked this yeah. up. And that is a pseudonym <laughs> for Steven Soderbergh. I saw that it was also edited by Mary Ann Bernard, oh, no. which is also a pseudonym Steven Soderbergh uses no. for editing. So Peter Andrews is actually his dad's name. Oh, really? And Marianne Bernard is his mom's oh, name. Oh, wow. So he goes by Peter Andrews when he does the cinematography, and he goes by Marianne Bernard when he does the editing. So oh, he did that for gosh. Unsane, and he also did it for this film. He did the cinematography and editing. Oh, wow. As those names. But if you look, and this is insane to me, I didn't realize this. Peter Andrews has shot every one of his films since 2000. He what? was also the cinematographer. I did not know that. For, Ocean's saw, El- for saw... all the Ocean's Eleven movies, oh for Magic God. Mike, for, for all of it. I didn't know he that. He also shot them, and he edited some of them that for 20 years. That is crazy. <laughs> uh, also, also in the cast is Bill Duke, which I love Bill Duke from Predator. Uh, he's right. one of the main guys in Predator. But he plays a, a coach at, uh, that hosts the game where this match happens. And he has a, a great scene with the main character where they start to break down kind of the history of the NBA. And he tells a story about the reason why the NBA started to integrate, Uh uh, integrate black characters into the league. He started to touch on this story about the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. um, And how they were doing so well, they boxed them out of the game because they were trying to control the entire situation. Right. They were, the Harlem Globetrotters were going out on their own way which now we think of him as this circus act. Yeah, I'm not even clear. Like he's talking about this in the you know in the '60s or something earlier like that. And I'm that. Yeah, you yeah. know <laughs> earlier than that, I'm like, wait, what? What did the Harlem Globetrotters do? So I was hoping that that Taylor would bring uh, the knowledge on this on this entire thing because it's but probably one of the best scenes of the movie. But I it, it really it sounds like there's a major story there yeah. to a degree, and I think that's that's more than worth uh, talking about now. Yeah. So. Sports, before everything got integrated, always separate. The only thing that had a slight foothold in it was boxing. Oh, really? But even then, they it was still very rare. We're talking before the 40s yeah. to have mixed race, any oh, wow. athletic yeah, matches yeah, yeah. of any sort. So there were the white leagues, and then there were the black leagues. Yeah. And the terminology historically, they call it the black fives because it's a five-man team in basketball. But the New York Renaissance was a team in in one of these black leagues. And then the Harlem Globetrotters was another one. Right. And very rarely they would play exhibition games between white teams, but not actually be a part of the league. Okay. And they would destroy them. Oh, yeah. And uh, actually, there was one guy, Joe Lapchick, who was the coach of the New York Knicks. In 47, he tried to lobby his league which was the Basketball uh-huh. Association of America, which then became the NBA to allow the Harlem Globetrotters into their league. They wouldn't allow it. So then in 50, the leagues kind of the white leagues kind of absorbed all together and became the NBA. Okay. But He's, not the black but not the black teams. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. But this guy Lapchick, who was the coach of the Knicks, signed Nat Clifton, who played for the Rens and the Globetrotters and joined the Knicks. Okay. And then that same season, there was from uh, West Virginia State, a guy who joined the Washington Capitals. And then there was another guy who joined the Celtics. And then there was another guy who played with the Blackhawks. Oh. So it was it was less like we're going to integrate the team and the Globetrotters are now a team in our league. Mm-hmm. But this guy was the first guy to say, oh, no, we want 
an African-American guy to play on the team. And it was one of the guys from the Globetrotters. But they knew about them because they played these exhibition games. I see. So it wasn't a true, true integration. But one of the guys who joined the Washington Capitals, he was saying, I'll post a link to an interview as well where I got all this. He was talking uh, and he was like saying, you know, even though I joined... I was still heckled and spat on by fans and, you know, but he was saying it was definitely no comparison to what Jackie Robinson had to deal with in baseball Mm -hmm. because Jackie Robinson was like the first and that was three years before this, Mm -hmm. but he was like the first of any sports to really be involved. So he took the brunt of it, but he sort of paved the way. And these guys still got a bunch of guff for it. The the emphasis of the scene is is suggesting that the the integration was driven strictly by by control. That if, right. that like if they, they were, were so able to yeah. go off on their own town, if they were had their own league, they could do their own thing, have their own contracts, do their own thing. If you bring them in, then you actually can control them. Yeah. And so that that is brought up uh, overtly and subtly through the rest of the film is how the the terms of the of the of really the contracts, the terms of the league yeah. can be viewed as an extension of slavery. Uh, right. You can contort it into into that. Uh, you can't. You absolutely can follow the line there, uh, and that is kind of what the film is suggesting. Is that, uh, and and I think it, Bill Duke even goes to say it is like we play the game better, so they put a game on top of the game, and so they play that game while we play this one. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's. It was pretty. It was pretty striking. That is probably the best scene. One of the best scenes of the movie. One of the people that comes up when you talk about those sort of concepts is this guy Harry Edwards, and he came into prominence because he organized the Olympic Project for Human Rights, which came about in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. Oh, and yeah. uh, I'll post a link to some articles and whatnot. But you might recognize the picture. It's the two guys with the black gloves, yeah. no shoes, heads down during. They're on the podium yeah, with another yeah, Australian yeah, yeah. guy. See, and, I've never quite known the context behind this. This is kind of one of those th- images thrown of the, you know right. through the, you know through the sixties, seventies, and eighties. It's just it's just one of those that are thrown in like Tiananmen Square, right, the, the right, Berlin Wall, <laughs> and the Kennedy, and you know, some it's sort of just some, kind yeah. of one of those flashes. The Challenger, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like uh, this goes by, and I'm like, wait, what was that? Uh, too bad. Yeah. Uh, so I'm go- they, I've actually never quite known uh, uh, what the photograph uh, yeah. uh, meant till now. So this was yeah, this was organized by this guy Harry Edwards, who had for years been teaching, writing, consulting. The book is called. The Revolt of the Black Athlete, mm-hmm. and it actually features in this film. So the movie opens with our main character, Ray, kind of scalding his player for talking with somebody during the lockout that he shouldn't have talked to. But And then it's the beginnings of what can we do during the lockout. And so in the middle of this conversation, he pushes a, a little uh, stamped package over across the table and tells his player to open it when he's ready. And a couple times that comes up, it's like, you'll know. You'll Just open it when you're ready. You'll know. You'll know when it's time. Lo and behold, he never opens it. The movie plays out. Uh, the end comes around. Sam, the assistant, of, the old assistant of Ray, is now dating Eric, the player. Mm-hmm. She opens the package. It is the book, The Revolt of the Black Athlete. Mm-hmm. She reads it. And the movie ends with her giving it to the player, Eric, going, you need to read this. I think that's the last line of the movie. And it's the first time at all that a movie has literally been like, hey, why don't you read yeah. <laughs> what this is based off of? Um, and I think that's actually the words is you need, need to, to read, read this. this. <laughs> <laughs> so I read it for everyone. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's this guy, Harry Edwards, like I said, he was in charge. And this book is his take. It came out in 69. So obviously, if the thing happened in 68, very shortly after. But it's a history of how racism was prevalent everywhere, including athletics, where people Mm -hmm. thought it was a bastion of freedom in this, what he calls a rose in the middle of a wasteland. He was like, it's part and parcel of that wasteland. It reeks of the same racism that corrupts the rest of the country. And also this is in the 60s. Can can permeate anything. Right. Uh, And 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 they're still around. That's kind of the... The, the great fallacy of the turn of the century is feeling as if we've kind of uh, we've Forgotten moved beyond it. Yeah, yeah, we're past it. No, I think that some of these things are still institutionalized because that's in it's in the language. Yeah, and it is the it is the building blocks of our society. Yeah, so we have to rethink these elements of it. Well, and especially when he's writing this and dealing with this and going on revolts and whatnot in the '60s, where it's like, oh look, absolutely, there's black athletes in God, white colleges. 60s. You know, isn't that great that we've integrated? And it's like, no, that's they're maybe even worse off than if they had just gone 
right. to a school where they right. didn't feel like they always had to perform and that was the only thing they're good for and they're not getting an education and tons of other right. problems that he brings up in the book. You can't just go there, we did it, brush off your hands and walk away. Yeah. It's like, no, the, the problem here permeates so many systems, institutions, and thoughts. So just a little bit on this Harry guy, because he actually does appear in the end of the film. He's the guy, the six foot eight tall guy with the beard and yeah. glasses that the main character, the agent, goes in after signing all the deals, getting everything worked out, the lockout ends. He goes into an office, shakes hands with this guy, and he's like, hey, thanks for meeting with me. Yeah, That's the guy who's the author of the book, oh, which wow. is the book that he gives to the young player. Oh, man, I didn't know that. So he's, it's assumed then, if you knew who he was, that he's been tied in That's to crazy. these concepts as well. But this guy, Harry Edwards, he has been a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He's consulted mm -hmm. for sports teams. He was notable for consulting the 49ers and the Golden State Warriors, which he then obviously also consulted Colin Wasn't it Kaepernick. enough for the 49ers? Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't enough. Well, he consulted Colin Kaepernick, who was a part of that team. Oh, there we go. No more, but you know, bringing up, obviously, conversations of civil rights, patriotism, social justice. What does it mean wow. in the realm of athletics? Yeah. Um, he was also an exceptional athlete. He got an, a scholarship to San Jose State University. And oh, wow. this is where he saw all of the problems because he was in it yeah. before the yeah, 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he was like, you know, I wanted to major in sociology, but I had to petition for that because all of the majors that they would let me major in didn't get me anywhere. Or it would be something that they thought would just be a fun diversion while I played sports and then yeah. didn't have a career afterwards. He graduated with honors then went to Cornell and got his doctorate in sociology. Ooh. He turned down tryouts with the Minnesota Vikings and the San Diego Chargers oh, wow. when he was pursuing his master's wow. in between that. And then once he earned his PhD, he returned to San Jose State as a professor. And so this is when he's organizing this Olympic project for human rights that happens. He starts it in 1967. And the three main things that they wanted to do with this was they wanted to restore Muhammad Ali's title. Um, okay. They wanted to remove Avery Brundage as the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee because he was a known white supremacist. Oh, wow. And he was the one who sealed the deal letting Adolf Hitler host the 36 Olympic Games oh, wow. in Berlin. Oh, my gosh. Um, and they wanted to uninvite South Africa and Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, because of the black freedom struggles that were happening in apartheid in those states. Right. Countries at gotcha. the time. Yeah. And they were like, well, we don't want that we can't involved in here. This. Yeah, we can't support that. <laughs> So he's at San Jose State, this Harry Edwards guy. Two of the dudes who end up being first and third place in the 200-meter dash are also from San Jose State University. Oh, wow. But all, in 1967, before this, they've been organizing and sending out leaflets. And okay. Martin Luther King Jr. was involved with him as well of being yeah. like, we need to let black athletes know and let the United States Olympic Committee know this is what we're about. Like, we're, this is a national or international stage to right. show human rights in general. Oh, fantastic. So yeah. there's these two guys, Smith and Carlos. Like I said, they won gold and bronze. They went up onto the podium. Like I said, you've, you've seen the picture of the gloved fist and their head bowed, no shoes. They were kicked off the U.S. team, sent home, stripped of their medals, removed from the Olympic Village. What? Ton of controversy because, like we said, this Avery Brundage guy who was the head of the Olympic Committee. Yeah was saying politics should not be involved. You know, like you receive your award for mm. your athletic achievement and you go away. But they were like, this guy. This is a stage for me, not you. <laughs> me, us. Also, <laughs> a lot of people saw it as anti-American and where that's where they got a bunch of criticism mm -hmm. coming back immediately after. Mm. But as they speak about it now, they're like, no, we were just trying to draw attention to inequality. Like, yeah. But this guy, Brundage, who was the head of the committee, allowed the Nazi salute in the previous Olympics because he said it was a national Jeez. salute and it's about a competition of nations and their salute was not about nations. And so it was unacceptable All right. and inappropriate. <laughs> okay. The backlash from them carried yeah. over to their lives, although they did end up, interestingly, got more publicity by the NFL. So Carlos, really? yeah, last name Carlos, the so one guy, he was a 15th round selection in the NFL draft in 1970. He was with the Eagles, but had a knee injury. And then he played in the Canadian Football League. And now he's a coach and counselor at Palm Springs High School. Oh, wow. The other guy, Smith, was drafted by the Los Angeles Rams, played with the Cincinnati Bengals, 
got his degree in social change from Goddard College and uh, taught sociology at Santa Monica College in California. So they kept doing. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they, they had their athletics doing, yeah. and then were involved in social justice and change as well. The one person who is missing from this is the second place guy, the random Australian guy in the middle. Mm-hmm. He's just sort of lost to history, and like, <laughs> it's like you know, like it's them two guys standing there with their fists up Him in the going, air. What? And the random <laughs> white guy in the middle in second place. Uh, Confused. <laughs> they told him that they were going to do this, and oh, really? he was super on board. If you look at the oh, picture, cool. yeah. he's wearing a patch for the OPHR, the Olympic Project for Human Rights. They gave him a patch, oh, cool. and so they told him everything that was going on. They had brought the gloves that they were going to wear, but one of the guys forgot their gloves, yeah. and so they're like, oh, well, what are we supposed to do? And so this guy, Peter Norman, suggested to them that they're like, well, why don't you wear the left one and he wears the right one. Like you both don't have to wear the right one. So if you look at the picture, one of them has their right fist raised and one of them has their left fist raised. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Because this, this uh, Australian guy was involved. He, he also had a ton of repercussions that happened for him because he was, he was seen as a troublemaker by the Olympics. He was ostracized by Australian running. He was not sent to the following Munich games but Australia had no sprinter for the first time in the Olympics. Oh, no. And he had qualified for it. No. But they just wouldn't send him. No. And he retired soon after and never won another title. Part- uh, <laughs> and he died of an overdose. No, <laughs> no, this no. This is no, how no. the story ends, Taylor. <laughs> no, no. Um, he is now recognized okay. for it, though. Okay. Uh, Carlos and Smith were pallbearers at his funeral. They, they maintained connection. And there's a famous monument of them, and the middle second place is left open, like at the big monument of Carlos and Smith, so that people can go stand there, like in Peter Norman's place, like, hey, be in solidarity with these people. Yeah. That's which I really think is cool. fascinating. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I, I love, I love that being able to stand, you know, being really physically stand there and put yourself between the two of them and, yeah, and, and fill the role that he did. That's, yeah. That's, I love I, anything that gets in an interactive idea there <laughs> is I love that, especially a monument because you so many of those you admire from far away. Yeah. Don't touch. There's a rope around. It. No, I love it. If like, yo, know, get up there and be like, you're supposed to <laughs> take a picture. You're supposed is. to. Yeah. You're supposed to think about it. You're supposed to look at both of them next to you and, and really think about what was this what was this moment? Even just the, the 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 small idea of just talking, communicating. Yeah. This is what we want to do. Even as simple as that. And mm-hmm. being like, oh, I'm for that. That's cool. Here. How do we do it here? Yeah. What, are, what were they trying to accomplish? Absolutely. Yeah. So that is the story behind the 68 Mexico City Olympics. My God. And this guy, Harry Edwards, who was the teacher at San Jose State, who had been an athlete in all these terrible times and was organizing all of these boycotts and protests and whatnot around the country Mm -hmm. leading up to and then in the biggest thing on the world stage. And so that is detailed in the book? Yes, it's his his journey as an athlete during this time and then his work and preparation and efforts in the 1968 Olympics. Wow. Because he was the head of this organization. Yeah. I'm just thinking about the implications at the end of the film, Ray giving that to Eric, his mm-hmm. player, um, and, and everything that they go through over the course of the film and trying to figure out, well, where, where, what is your worth? What is it? Where does it really lie? And you need to be thinking about what, what you have. Who are you? Who are you really? And what do you have? Um, yeah. Your, your name, your likeness, uh, and your word. Are are some of some of the only things you truly have to barter with. So when you strip it all down, you strip down all of the the posh politics and persona, the publicity, the all of those all of those things, and you think about, well, who am I really? And what do I have to work with? And how can I use that to get where I need to go? Yeah, and more importantly, do the homework. Look at history. People have done absolutely this exactly. Actually, the guy is like in the movie. It's like that guy is literally in my office, and I'm talking to yeah. him right now. <laughs> which I, no, I feel like nobody that saw that movie would know. Not at all, because I didn't know the I book just either. Flew right, by. <laughs> but it's just funny that the movie was like, "Hey, here, viewer, do some homework. Yeah, learn yeah. about this a little bit more." Definitely an interesting one. Something I knew nothing about. Me either. This was. I'm glad. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> we messed up. We're, we're embarrassed. <laughs> 
we did one that has nothing to do with what's going on right now, but but it will. Uh, <laughs> and, but the more we talk about it, the more I'm just like, wow, this is this had a lot of meat. We were gonna, we were, okay. The, the honest truth, we were between this and high fidelity, and we looked at this, and we were like, this one's way meatier. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that is what it is. Hopefully, you learned something. At least you know what a lockout is now. Um, I, I think that we we like to forget, we like to lull into that everything is okay. This this film really did speak out to me and saying, hmm, you might be playing into something that was set up long, long, long ago that nobody's even paying attention to. So yeah. I think that's always worth bringing back. We're bringing it back. We're bringing it back. Let us know what you thought. What are you watching? What are you excited for? Anything coming out? At Illiterate Pod on Instagram. We would love to hear from you, please. please. Also, reach out to us. You'll get a sticker. Yeah. Free stickers. A free sticker. I use it as a bookmark sometimes, but a uh, free sticker, Illiterate, Find Evil, Read Books. That's what it says in, in beautiful yellow and red. Um, so get one for free. Reach out to us. At Illiterate Pod on Instagram. And we'll catch you next week.